Hi, we're about to start our webinar on how to get your AP team ready for the future. People are just joining us now. If you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat, please do. And we'll be getting going very shortly. So welcome to this webinar looking at how to build a future ready accounts payable team today sponsored by Bottom Line. Accounts payable leaders and their teams have to be aware of the risks, the threats and the opportunities that there are and that they could expect to have to deal with in the short and long term. Today we'll be discussing how you can make sure that your AP function and team are ready to face the threats head on and capitalise on the opportunities there are to enhance efficiency. There'll be a guide available following the session, so no need to make notes. And please put any questions you have in the chat and we'll hope to deal with them as we go along. We'll also have a couple of questions for you in polls, so please join in with those. I'm Sue Beardsmore. With me today, three experts with huge experience in AP, shared services and fraud on the right side, of course. They'll be giving their insights and suggestions as to how you can build an accounts payable team ready for the future with the skills, the technology and the right processes to achieve the best possible performance. Louise Graham has worked in financial operations for over 30 years, starting with the Walt Disney Company in London, subsequently working for companies including Santander, Carphone Warehouse and Costa Coffee. She has experience in managing and developing finance teams, leadership and performance turnaround. Hi, Louise. Hi. Richard Ransom is Head of Solutions Consulting with Bottom Line, which transforms payments and processes for companies around the world. Richard's worked with corporates of all sizes for vendors, banks, payment schemes and infrastructure providers. His specialities include today's business payment methods and the future business payment landscape. Gary Stevens. Hi, Richard. Gary Stevens is one of our experienced, most experienced IFOL trainers, delivering masterclasses and workshops on all aspects of AP and P2P. With over 40 years in the finance industry, he has experience of leading large teams through change and significant improvement. So we're going to be starting with skills, a poll in a moment. As a leader, it's crucial to have an awareness of the skills your team needs, short, medium, long term, with a plan of when to start training and building those skills in the team. So just before we do the poll and go on to discuss real specifics, what's changed? There have been some fundamental shifts in the recent past. What would you categorise them as? Do you want to go first, Louise? Oh, what's changed? Um, I think what's changed is that um, automation is much more prevalent. Uh, so I think it's quite rare these days to see an accounts payable department actually keying invoices, although it does definitely still happen quite amazingly. Um, so I, I think automation has become much more sort of part, part of life in accounts payable. That's right. what I'd say the main thing. Anything to add to that, Gary Richard? Um, yeah, I think yeah, definitely automation has, has moved at a pace over the last sort of 10, 15 years, without doubt. Alongside that, you've got the downside of potentially more fraud being um, hitting uh, AP teams, etc. from the fraudsters. They're getting more clever and using automation and, and software to, to do that. So, so that's something that we all need to be aware of and obviously something that we're going to speak about during the webinar today. Sure. So you agree, Richard, biggest shift automation? So I think um, I agree with what Gary um, and Louise have said. I also think, so fraud is one of the biggest changes and continues to change. I also think the focus on cash flow within organisations, and there is a um, definite link to that and the accounts payable process. And how, we'll probably go on to this a little bit more, but how do you assess what's needed? That must be the toughie in training terms. Who wants to have a little go at that? Do you look at the whole team? Do you look at individuals? Do you do you make sure there are basic skills in place? What what, what do you start looking at when you're uh, trying to assess? I, what I, you're... I think you look at the business requirement. What's the business requirement? Is it to have a good relationship with your suppliers and pay them to terms? It mostly is. Whilst optimizing cash flow and also providing a really good service to your internal customers, your colleagues, who very often want to do the right thing, but they don't always know how to. And so I think communication from accounts payable is really important to say, this is how uh, you follow our processes. 
So you start think, with what you want to get out of it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, and I think I think encouraging your teams to look outside into the wider world, being part of the AP community. There are plenty of events and webinars and places to look, see what other organisations are doing, see what their peers are doing. That's a really important way to see. And as a, as a manager, you'll see that as well. If you go to a conference, you'll see what people are talking about and you'll know what you have to focus your teams on in the future. Yeah, I definitely agree with what Richard's saying. I think benchmarking yourself against other like, like-minded like organisations. I mean, I was in public sector, so we were able to provide statutory performance indicators. So you're able to see how you were performing against other for example, local authorities. So for me, that was a big driver for needing to change because at the time we were not performing well. And ultimately, you want to look after your supplier base and make sure you're paying them on time. So that's a rather key driver to look at your performance. OK, so a few clues there, but we'll go to our poll, our first poll and see what people think. So if you could join in with this poll, which skills do you believe will be most important for your particular team to further develop over the next three to five years? And in this case, you have only one choice, the one thing you think you need to focus on. Customer service, data analytics, fraud detection, financial accounting, effective communication, leadership and management. And of course, they're all important, but which one do you think you need to focus on for your team over the next three to five years? And if you could uh, give us your answer, we'll wait a couple of moments for the magic to brew and we'll see what the what the outcome is. Customer service, data analytics, fraud detection, financial accounting, effective communication, leadership and management. And you have just one choice. There's a lot of thinking about it going on. So broad detection. I think we're in the right place and effective communication. OK, what, what do you think about those choices? Uh, panel. Who, who I, I think I? that's really interesting, the fraud detection one, because um, as Gary and Richard said, fraudsters are getting cleverer and cleverer. And, you know, we, we need to be in accounts payable. We, we need to be on top of it and we need to be identifying fraud before it happens or, uh, yeah, before it happens, <laughs> not while <laughs> it happens. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's really interesting. And it's a really hard one as well because they're sophisticated. I've seen yeah. some really um, very realistic looking um, request to change bank account, for example. That's a really easy fraud. Um, very, very nearly did it in one of my previous organisations and had my AP manager not made a phone call uh, to check that the supplier did want the bank account changed, we'd have paid a fraudster £2 million and we yeah. didn't because of a phone call that an AP manager made. So I think fraud detection is absolutely important. I'm, I'm pleased to see that's up there. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that fraud detection is so high. I, I am less delighted that financial accounting isn't higher up in that list. I think understanding how... AP um, AP function reacts and interacts with other departments is really important. I think realising, understanding and elevating the part of AP in that process is important for the rest of the business. Working with colleagues in AR and cash management and treasury. You've got to understand as AP that you've got a really vital part to play in the cash flow and the financial health of an organisation. So if your processes are running well, it helps forecasting. Forecasting helps investment decisions. It helps the payment process at the end of your um, process as well so your suppliers will be paid on time if the business knows the money's there to pay them and they'll only know that if the forecasting is accurate and you're able to process on time so I think it's really key in AP to have a much better idea of how the accounting process works across your organization and your organization in particular as well because you would be surprised how important it is you've processed the, the invoices that you process on a daily basis in terms of the whole business that you're part of. Harry? Yeah, not surprised about fraud. I think we've touched on that already. Um, data analy analytics was an interesting one. We spoke about uh, trying to look at performance of your organisation. So I think data analytics has got a massive role to play in and seeing how that relates to performance. Um, also, um, external communications and customer service, I think both of those can sort of be, be linked. And it was good to see that there was quite a number of that were putting some um, preference on those as being areas that they were looking to to improve over the next sort of three to five years because I think that's extremely important 
never forget about your customers and your suppliers, as I said before, um, making sure that you're you're looking after them and paying them on time. So we only gave people one choice. And of course, all those things are really important. What, what would you, if you were given fewer choices than the whole list, which skills are really critical and perhaps ones that people haven't thought about as much? What do you consider critical, Louise, that, that people really have got to get, if you want, the basics right about? I think it's about attention to detail. So, you know, if you've got good attention to detail, then you're going to pick up your fraud. So, you know, in, in the case that I just mentioned of nearly making a two million pound payment, actually somebody noticed the date format was American and the company we were dealing with was a UK one. So uh, the legitimate company, the fraudsters were um, operating out of an uh, American base. So, uh, yeah, I think attention to detail is really important and not talked about that much, actually. But it's quite important to get it right. You get a yeah. point, in the wrong, point in the wrong place can be a lot of money. Yeah, Louise, I think I totally agree with that. And I also think that having a continue making this continuous development as well. So the fraudsters vectors are changing constantly. So building a process three years ago and not reviewing it since in terms of what you say, you know, that potential um, pointing a supply payment in the wrong place. These things change. And, you know, it was a time when headed paper was enough. So we've got it on headed paper. So that's good enough. But it's not good enough anymore. So you can't even trust a phone call or potentially a um, video call from someone because these things can be faked and are. So, yeah, you've got a, that constant improvement, a constant process around that. So training in that fraud piece, really important. But you've got to keep going and you have to change that and review it all the time. Yeah, because they are. They are. The fraudsters exactly. are continually improving on what they're doing to, to, to get more cash. So And... Is it possible to see any changes? Can you see any changes down the line or are things moving, changing so quickly that, that it's more a reactive situation? Are, are there things that people can put in place before something happens that we don't even know about yet? I think with, with some organisations with fraud, it is a reactive thing. They, they actually get hit by a fraud and then they decide to do something about it. I think you need to try and shift that mindset and, and try yeah. and prevent it happening in the first place there's lots of software providers out there that can provide fraud uh, and analytic data and, and software that can help you um, even before you do your payment runs to check to make sure you're not paying duplicate invoices or the things that don't look right and it's a very quick exercise to be able to do that and i think sometimes um, organizations lose the track of the importance of that Maybe it's a cost thing, but at the end of the day, one fraud can wipe off profit from a business and, and put it under. Is that a risk that they're willing to take? So I think there's, there's got to be a mindset to move to more prevention rather than being reactive to, to frauds. And I, I know we're talking a lot about fraud in this session, but it's really important that we do, because I think it's only then when people are discussing it all the time that these messages get down and the ability and the budgets available to AP to invest in software. So... In the UK, we now have the confirmation of payee service. So you can link um, an account. You can check that an account is definitely a business account and definitely belongs to the person you think you're paying. And you're not paying someone internally, inadvertently. Someone on your payroll has just put their own sort code and account number details against a supplier. So there are tools available, but it's just getting, getting the budget to buy those tools. But a lot of that comes down to education and really being on top of it. So mm. I think I'm... We're seeing a lot more focus on that, especially in this community. And I think that's that can only be a good thing. So I know it's quite a lot of our webinar today, but these things, it, it's always coming out, isn't it? This, these are the things that are so important. Yeah. A, a question's already occurred to somebody that you touched on cost there. Um, and from Alim Mawani, how do you automate AP when your ERP system can't be upgraded and replacing it would cost billions of dollars? So that kind of balance of what you need to do and what you can do. Anybody want to respond to that question? Probably. Yeah, so the, sorry, <laughs> Gary, you go first. I was just going to say you're probably in a good place to, to be able to answer that one. But I would find that most ERP systems, most providers have linked in with just about every ERP system. So I would suggest that you, 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 know, you go out to the market, speak to people and see what the position is and how they can link in i'm not sure what that specific question the erp system is but i'm pretty sure that, that, that they could 
hopefully provide an automated system for it. But Richard will possibly answer that better than me. Yeah, so, and I think um, you're absolutely right, Gary. What we see is a mixture of fully integrated solutions. So the organisation will fully integrate into your ERP. But there are also solutions that will interface to a point so they'll do most of the matching process. They don't have to necessarily be fully integrated in your ERP to do that. So there's a, there is a range. So yes, where you're running a legacy ERP system or just the cost of updating, because we know sometimes professional services in that world are, are fairly pricey on top of your automation solution. But there are standalone automation solutions. You can have a capture portal that can um, help you match outside of your ERP and just improve your process outside of it. So you will get gains. But yes, they, you know, that's as in all things, there are ranges. But you know, Gary's right. I think most ERPs will have some form of connector into, into an invoice automation solution today. Okay, another piece of advice being looked for here and a slightly uh, slightly different issue, but one I know I've heard you all mention. Uh, Joanna, the artist department are always rush payments. Any suggestions? Yeah, I do. <laughs> so, so, so actually, a couple of things. I think uh, people who are trying to defraud you try to create a sense of urgency. And I think it's worth saying that because I don't think enough AP departments understand that. I think people uh, quite often think if somebody says it's urgent then it must be so I think we need to not respond to people saying it's really urgent um and I think I think there need to be set timetables about when we do things and you need to try and not do things out of process there need to not be manual payments and things that are made outside your system um yeah don't stop and take a minute before you respond is what I would say because a sense of urgency is a bit of a red flag for a potential fraud yeah and presumably that supplier will have signed up to your payment terms, which could be 30 days, for example. So, you know, unless there's a really, really huge excuse for paying it early, 30 days, as long as you're paying it within that, I don't see that it's an issue. Yeah, if there's a, you know, sometimes if there's an if there's an urgent payment, it shows that your process, there's something about their process, if they're banging from there's wrong. So they they've left it too late. They've mm -hmm. been sitting on an invoice, it's sat in a in a mailbox or on a desk for too long. I think we're you know the paper invoice being hidden in the drawer is, is probably world is behind us, but I think um, you're absolutely right. It's a massive red flag. You shouldn't need to do it. And I think where we're talking about those potential um, fraud situations, I don't think any CFO is going to be cross with you if you've said to the CEO, I'm not going to make this payment because it's not gone through the process. I'm really sorry. I don't think anyone's going to going to have a problem with that. So in those businesses where things come up and, and, and it sounds as though that did, you know, we've got to have it today. Well, you can't have it unless you pay for it today. It, it's kind of discussing things, finding out the processes ahead of time and yeah. saying we, we can't, we just can't take this. I mean, is that your advice overall, really? I mean, as your processes and procedures become more automated, you have to rely on your payment terms, in which case that invoice is processed and gets paid on X date. You can't start bypassing that it's leaving you wide open to other issues the fraud obviously a big one so find a way okay let's move on to a bit more about the technology so change is the one constant as far as technology goes um brief views before we go into the poll about major changes over the last five years pick one <laughs> what would you say I think it's just the move the auto Information keeps moving at a pace. We're now, we're now, we've got the AI letters now, if you like, yeah. uh, coming into, into play. So that's going to have a massive impact in the next uh, few years and how that how that plays out on both sides of the fence, us and fraudsters, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay. Well, let's, let's just see what people are feeling, thinking about their teams at the moment. So having the right technology in place, this is our poll, get ready to press your buttons. Uh, for allowing the AP teams to work at their best is critical. What types of technologies have or would you like to impl implement for this purpose? So invoice processing automation, fraud detection software, mailbox automation and management, data analytics, digital payments, robotic process automation. And so which would you like out of these? And it's a single choice again. You might love them all if you could afford them, but uh, which would you go for? Invoice processing automation, fraud detection software, mailbox automation and management, data analytics, digital payments, 
or robotic process automation. So there's six things to choose from there. You have a single choice, and then we'll perhaps look at them with the panel. I'll be pressing the buttons right now. Invoice processing automation, fraud detection software, mailbox automation and management, data analytics, digital payments, or robotic process automation, right. So a, a mm -hmm. clear, clear winner there. So panel's views on the choices and the particular pieces of technology. That's interesting. We haven't scared everyone that much <laughs> on fraud because it didn't come out top, which I thought it might do <laughs> after all that. But yeah, it, invoicing processing. Yeah, of course. Who wants to be typing in invoices? Like I said, I have seen, even in the last five years, uh, I have seen people still actually physically typing invoices into systems, which is just it's a 21st century, why would we be doing that? So yeah, invoice processing automation. And I think the sort of holy grail of that is uh, invoices that go straight through. So an invoice comes in electronically, it's matched to a receipt, it's matched to an order, there's a three-way match, it goes into the system, it's approved, nobody looks at it, and it's paid when it comes to the nearest payment run to its due date. You know, that's, that's, that's the holy grail, that's what you really want. Don't see it very often, unfortunately. Any other choices, Richard? No, so I'm I'm not surprised digital payments has come up with zero. I think you know, in the UK we're we're through that. We're not paying our suppliers by a check anymore. I don't think there's any benefit to doing that. And you know, uh, the fraud detection is an interesting one that came second, but that um, automation piece is is really key because the tools are out there. The goals have changed for automation as well because very you know five ten years ago. The software was sold about how you know the OCR, so OCR. how good it was at reading the invoice. But now most invoices are PDFs, and the data is already sitting in there. So it now becomes, how do you make that process really good? So the three-way match, no PO, no pay, but also receipting. So I've spoken to several organisations in the past year who aren't receipting at the moment, or are only doing that for services. It it doesn't make sense because those tools are in place. The matching has got better. AI has is in there, and machine learning. So the patterns are good. You know, you you have to do less and less. These systems learn. But, yeah, it's it's different, completely different goals now than five, ten years ago. So but these are big projects and need you need to examine all of your processes. So when you're automating the invoice in, you also think about the payment out as well. So how is that part of the process? Have you spent a lot of time? looking at the approvals and all the different people involved in the process to approve that invoice. If it's not straight through, you've ignored the payment side and that potentially leaving air gaps and opportunities for fraud in that process. Okay. Um, before we move on even further, can I just take you back? Um, you're thanked for your advice about, you know, don't pay in a rush. Uh, but Joanna, who raised the issue, said, unfortunately, we're always dealing with small vendors and don't have payment terms. So would you have any recommendations for sort of trying to help with that? Yeah. So uh, so, so the business I work in now, we've got a lot of small vendors with very short payment terms. Uh, we've got an awful lot on seven days. I think expectation management is really key. So, you know, you need to work out what is it, what, what's the ask? What is it they want? Can you actually physically do it? Uh, you know, immediate is not a, a, a realistic or achievable payment term. Of course it isn't. Nobody can pay immediately. Um, no business can generally pay immediately. Um, so I think it's about managing expectations and agreeing up front what the what what date will the invoice come in? Where will it come in? Who's going to approve it? Are they going to approve it quickly? And are you going to set the terms on the system so that it matches with your normal payment run? You don't want to do things outside of normal process. And then manage the supplier expectations. So maybe we can't pay you in five days, but we can pay you in seven. Um, and, and and also making sure that people internally understand what the what what are realistic deadlines okay. and payment dates. Tell them not to go out and agree immediate two days, three days, four days, whatever. You know, if, if you've got to shorten it to seven days, mm -hmm. you're going to need to have the invoice on day one or two to to get it into your system, to get it processed, and to get it approved. Okay. And before we. Um. Oh, sorry, you want to add something? Sorry, I was just got to touch on what Louise was saying. I think as well, if whoever's um, doing the business with the small uh, organisations, 
if you've got if your organization's payment terms are 30 days, then maybe they should be told at that point, look, our terms are 30 days. We very rarely pay at seven. It has to be a, a really strong case to pay earlier than that. So I think it helps right up front to make them aware that they won't get paid until 30 days. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll get back to our, our technology. Um and interestingly, a comment was made by somebody um in, in the room that they manually put in a thousand invoices a month. So there are there are other bit other pieces of uh technology still required in some places. Okay. So where why and where should people be looking to invest in technology for the AP function in, in your opinion and advice? Everybody's got limited budgets. What what makes most sense at the moment that they should be trying to cover off? Richard? Obviously, moving, oh. sorry, moving, sorry, I got to no, right. Go, Gary. <laughs> I was just going to tap the, the IFO annual survey now, off the top of my head. I think there was still around about 42% of businesses that responded that are still not moved to full to automation or full automation. So that's still an awful lot of businesses out there that are still manually keying. Okay, yeah. So so there's a there's a lot of room for improvement there, definitely within the automation. And I think just the benefits that that brings to you and being more effective and efficient as well. I mean, who wants to be typing in uh, day to day and day out? Some people like to do that, but most people in an AP team, they like to develop the skills. And I think that's the opportunity that automation also gives you within your teams as well. So um, definitely automation is something that organizations need to be looking at to improve it effectiveness efficiency okay. i think you should yeah as an organization you should also be looking into that budget pot for for the fraud any any sort of fraud prevention measures they can so whether that's something like confirmation of pay whether that's just some form of check on account ownership when in master data or in the system you use to send payments these things are really important and it doesn't have to be they don't have to be massively expensive to make a really big impact on the process so putting, being obvious and putting fraud measures in your team will notify people in your team there aren't, you know, the the opportunities for fraud are, have been reduced and removed and that opportunity makes a thief and you don't know the motivations of people in your team necessarily. But if they can see they can't crack this, then they won't. I think they don't have to be big. They don't have to be large investments to make a big difference to how you operate and reducing fraud and risk. And error as well, because you don't want to pay the wrong supplier. OK. In a much bigger survey than this uh, about around fraud detection software, 60% um, said they were looking to implement it and 40% said they weren't. Why do you think not? Do you think it's just down to cost or do you think some people just don't think it it is important for them? I think it's like Gary said earlier, people are reactive. So once they've been hit by a fraud, they're going to go, oh, <laughs> how can we stop? happening again <laughs> which is you know that is called uh shutting the door after the horse has bolted right um and i think also organizations they don't tend to in my experience have a budget pot that is called yeah. fraud fraud prevention <laughs> um and even if they are hit with a fraud it's embarrassing right so yeah. <laughs> they don't necessarily want to admit to it so they don't have a fraud prevention pot they don't have a bucket in their accounts for we were hit by fraud because our processes are rubbish or whatever so um yeah i i think i think it needs to be taken really seriously and there needs to be a fraud prevention pot in the budget really for software that prevents it or processes that prevent it or financial controls that prevent it that kind of thing yeah and i think i think louise there are organizations who think they have fraud prevention nailed they think yeah. their process for identifying Vendor changes to vendor data are really good because they've been using them for the fast last five years and they haven't had a fraud. I think that's another situation as well. So they think they've got it. They think because we're checking headed paper or we're ringing someone up, that's that works and that's fine. But as you say, as soon as you get hit, then sudden, suddenly the money comes out somewhere, doesn't it? Okay. Or it's too embarrassing, as you said, and someone gets disappeared out of the organisation, but there's no real punishment for that person they're uh, going to court is quite an extreme step and you don't necessarily want people to think that you're allowing fraudsters to work in your organization so there is that as well which is which is why it's surprising that 40 percent of organizations don't 
don't want to spend money on fraud prevention. OK, and before we move on to look at fraud a bit more, uh, fraud specifically a little bit more, uh, it's important to say that the technology won't sort you out if you haven't sorted everything else out, the processes, the the vendor master data, things like, like that. They, it doesn't take away from needing to do that properly, does it? No, I mean, sure. even if you've got strong processes, you're still, you're still, there's still risks of fraud, regardless of how effective yep. and efficient you are. And a lot of finance directors maybe don't want to admit that there's a risk of fraud. They think everything's working fine. We don't have a problem. I think I think it's worth highlighting. I think KPMG did a bit of work a, a number of years ago about the typical fraudster in an organisation, and it's not it's not someone brand new straight out of college. It's someone who's who's male over forty, been in the organisation more than six years. These people really know the process and may have put the process in place themselves. So that's why that complacency is difficult, and why you need to trust other tools as well. That's a really good point, actually, Richard, because it's not just looking at people out with the organisation that can be, be fraudulent, be causing fraud. It's the inside the organisation. It's, it's just it's the people, as Richard said, have been working for a, a lot of years in the organisation. And uh, that's something that's not always taken into account of and overlooked. So okay, really well, important point. let's go to uh, the people here today because they clearly are interested in the issue of fraud. Third poll, last poll. Fraud is a continually rising issue for AP teams, um, often the number one target. How do you plan to reduce the risk of your AP team being a victim of fraud? So advanced fraud training, utilising fraud prevention tools, analysing processes and strengthening controls, have a continual process in place. So it's a single choice again as to be the most important so how do you plan to reduce the risk of your AP team being a victim of fraud? One choice, advanced fraud training, utilising fraud prevention tools, analysing processes and strengthening controls, have a continual process in place. And one choice out of those four, clearly probably all important, but which is most important to you and your team at the moment. And then we'll see what we think about the the outcome. So, oh, pretty pretty even across the way, but analyzing processes and strengthening controls ahead of tools, training, or a continual process. Okay, what, what what's your views on the outcome there, panel? How who'd like to go first? Yeah, I will. Okay, uh, okay I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to. Analyzing processes and strengthening controls. You know, what you want is really good, robust processes, robust financial controls that are, as Richard just said, that you don't just go, oh, well, you know, we've had that in place for years. You need to be continually reviewing your processes and your controls. And you need, as far as possible, and I know it's not always possible, you might have collusion or whatever or internal fraud. As far as possible, you need to make sure that the process um, is supporting you in. In, in not allowing for by having good good financial controls uh so you know and good control of your master data as well richard gary what would you like to throw in richard thanks yeah, so getting there this this is a um yeah i think absolutely analyzing those processes but continually doing that make that a a continuous process and think about how the world of fraud is changing and once I, once again i said you know there's plenty of opportunity the AP community is really lucky. There are lots of conferences, lots of information. So hear what people are saying about fraud and new vectors. I think um, with confirmation of payee, allowing a live check of sort code account number of bank ownership, that's going to really help AP do that. And I know some organisations already do it. They might be typing into e-banking as they're adding a, a vendor because it's really helpful. Fraudsters will learn that that is a process in place and that's how that's as a check that's in place and they will also learn potentially that's the check you don't have in place so what they're doing is continually changing i think ai makes things a bit scarier because some of the checks you did before like ringing someone up or you know being on a video call you can't trust those things necessarily anymore so it's a it's an anal analysis of processes beyond just your 
invoice um the invoice process you do how are those payments being approved further upstream as well who's doing that how's that data getting to my payment system is it secure all the way or is it a file being transferred onto someone's computer and uploaded into a into an ERP or uploaded into e-banking, just it's a lot bigger than you may think. So you start to touch the surface. So you've got to really, really widen out to the point at which the payment leaves the organization. Do you have any current examples that you've come across that that would make people think that show them the kind of thing that's happening that they might not think is not possible, but they hope not to come across? So um Outside of a in in Hong Kong, we know a um, an employee was um, made multi million dollar payment out of a business after being on a video call with someone who thought they thought was the CFO of their organization, and and it wasn't. It was a deep fake, so highly sophisticated wow. fraud, but but amazingly easy to fall for that. And I wouldn't think of that. So you may not know your CFO that well in the organization if you're working in in AP. But you may recognise their name or their photo from, you know, intranet, and you may think, right, okay, I've heard this name, I know this is Pat or whoever, and this sounds right, this sounds legitimate. So someone is managing to to do that, and I think that's a good outside one on on an internal basis. Um, a couple of years ago, a very large organisation um, in the UK, how a worldwide recognised brand. Um, someone within their AP department managed to steal um, close to £6 million over three years, made 59 fraudulent transactions simply by changing the sort code and account number against the vendor record to their own. So they knew the process, sent invoices in, which were approved because they were under the radar. After they processed a number under the radar, started sending higher value ones in, testing the process. And if they hadn't, done stupid things like buying a diving school in Mauritius, then they wouldn't probably wouldn't have been spotted. But these, you know, it's that's a lot of money. That's 59 transactions not spotted. This is a large organization. So having a having a really having a a huge ERP, big name ERP, all these things don't help when there are easy processes to break like that. So I think just simply being able to check a sort code and account number is really important checking that master date is really important continuing to change that process is really important but also don't trust if it if it's different and it's out of the ordinary don't trust that process if i don't normally get a call from the cfo asking me to transfer three and a half million dollars because there's an important business deal going through i i i shouldn't trust that i think that's my view i should be asking questions or contact contacting them separately but it won't be as extreme with that always it might just be a couple of thousand pounds but it's different and it's a it's it's an anomaly and you have to be able to prick up your ears and think like this doesn't smell right and i think you made uh louise you talked about that earlier so that american date format it's a very very small thing to think okay that's different and that needs a, a person to be thinking that kind of thing and yes, that exactly gary anything that you would like to add in there I just felt all four of the, the, the selections were very much inter, interact with each other. I would have found it quite difficult, actually, to pick one of the four. Um, but I think, you know, the starting point is probably re is analysing your process and strengthening your controls. A lot of the reasons Richard gave, trying to identify red flags as well in terms of what's happening within your processes. Um, so advanced fraud training is really really important um, even just to liaise with other organizations similar to yourselves that might have had a fraud attempted be, you know getting feedback from them as to this is happening at the moment be aware we used to do that within our sort of local authorities up in scotland we would we would say we've had an attempted fraud just be aware it's this this supplier that they're trying to to uh you know headed paper with their logo and everything all looks looks correct and everything like that but they've tried a fraud so so word of mouth is always a good way of, of trying yeah. to keep abreast abreast of fraud as well um so and then as we've touched on as well you know it's getting some an, anti-fraud software in there um that that's always a a safety net that you can put into your process as well um try and get some money for that if you can i know it's it's difficult but uh, that's that fraud pot that we've spoken about isn't it trying to have some money set aside for that 
Thanks very much indeed. Oh, Richard, sorry. Yeah, so I say you made a good, good point about the word of mouth. I think people can be observant. So um, places like LinkedIn are very good at highlighting where there's been AP fraud, and you'll see it in local papers as well, because that's a really good story to do. And if you see one of those stories, just look at your organisation and say, could, could that happen to us in mm. that way? Because, of, you know, the, the report is usually pretty accurate. So could there be a situation in my organisation where someone could put their own account details in and process an invoice without anyone seeing that? And I think a lot of organisations would be surprised if they had a quick, could that happen to us check against a lot of these frauds? Could that happen to us? Um your advice is being asked just before we go. We only got a, about a minute or so. Uh, there's an assumption that with invoice processing automation, fewer human resources are needed in AP team. In my experience, it's not true. Um, what's your opinion? They're needed for other skills and other uh, processes and things to be doing. Uh, I find another skill set's required in the AP team now, data anal analysis, customer service, fraud detection. So I think that goes with what you've all been saying any anything to add to that you need at least yeah. the same amount of people yeah you need human beings to do the value added stuff like building That's relationships good. internally um helping internal colleagues with questions doing maybe process mapping you know, the, the really value added human stuff, that's what you need the people to do. So it's not always about a headcount reduction. Sometimes it's just yeah. about doing better things with the people you've got, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I think it's easy to conflate um efficiency gains with with headcount reduction and i think a lot of it as you said it's about making once you are automating that process which can be automated everything else can get better so yeah. you are yeah the analytic analytics you're helping the organization with the cash flow all of these things but yeah it shouldn't just be about we can we, we can remove two heads because now we've got something that scans our invoices your suppliers still want to talk to you people still want a conversation if there's an issue they want a conversation if they need you know if uh, you know if you're late paying or they've got an issue with their with their issuing of their invoice or there's a problem with the po invoice automation doesn't help that bit so if something doesn't match someone someone should be speaking to someone about it because ai and invoice automation isn't going to make a phone call and have a chat and keep a supplier relationship good because People are really important in this process. Absolutely. Good moment to, to end on. You need the tools, need the training, definitely need the people. Thanks to Louise Graham, Gary Stevens and Richard Ransom from Bottom Line, who also sponsored today's webinar. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on membership and courses, please head to the IFOL website. This webinar will be available on the IFOL website from tomorrow. So please share with any colleagues who may be interested. And we'll send a link to top suggestions and a PDF best practice guide. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you, Sue. Thank Thanks. you, everybody. Bye. Bye.